I open my eyes and I don't know where I am or who I am. Not that that's unusual. I spent half of my life not knowing. Still, this feels different. The confusion is more frightening, more total. I look up. I'm lying on the floor beside the bed. I remember now. I move from the bed to the floor in the middle of the night. I do that most nights. Better for my back. Too many hours in a soft mattress causes agony. I count to three, then start the long, difficult process of standing. With a cough and a groan, I roll onto my side. Then I curl into the fetal position. Then flip over onto my stomach. Now I wait, and wait, for the blood to start pumping. I'm a young man, relatively speaking, 36. But I wake as if I'm 96. After three decades of sprinting, stopping on a dime, jumping high and landing hard, my body no longer feels like my body, especially in the morning. Consequently, my mind doesn't feel like my mind. Upon opening my eyes, I'm a stranger to myself. And while again this isn't new, in the mornings it's more pronounced. I run quickly through the basic facts. My name is Andre Agassi. My wife's name is Stephanie Graff. We have two children, a son and a daughter, five and three. We live in Las Vegas, Nevada, but currently reside in the suite at the Four Seasons Hotel in New York City, because I'm playing in the 2006 U.S. Open, my last U.S. Open, in fact, my last tournament ever. I play tennis for a living, even though I hate tennis. I hate it with a dark and secret passion, and always have. As this last piece of identity falls into place, I slide to my knees and whisper, please let this be over. Then I say, I'm not ready for this to be over. And this is a paragraph from the book we're going to talk about today, opened by Andre Agassi and ghost written by J.R. Mulringer. Wonderful. But before we get to that book, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to welcome you all to Performers. Now, this is the podcast that takes you inside the minds of the world's most extraordinary athletes, coaches, and performers. We're your hosts. I'm Dr. Greg Young, and you've just heard from Dr. Duncan Simpson. And as sports psychology experts, we'll guide you through the pages of autobiographies, revealing the mindsets, strategies, and habits that propelled the world's best to the pinnacle of their fields. So, Duncan, what is it about this book that made you uh, want to start with it? Yeah, I've decided to start this podcast with my all-time favorite autobiography, um, Open, as I mentioned. Those not familiar with Andre Agassi, you know, one of the all-time great tennis players, you know, over 31 million in career earnings, 61 titles, eight grand slams, an Olympic gold medal. He's an inductee into Tennis Hall of Fame. But this story is so much more. It's, it's an amazing autobiography. It is about tennis, but it's also about celebrity romances. It's about his wigs. It's about really challenging parenting. Uh, there's mental health issues. There's drug, st- uh, drug struggles. It, it's really a remarkable story. Uh, it certainly is. I'd have to agree with that. If we don't agree with anything else today, I think we can certainly agree with that. It is remarkable. So let's take a step back before we jump into the book itself. Why, why this podcast? What, why, what makes this something that you want to talk about? There's a lot of podcasts out there, isn't there, Greg? But <laughs> yeah. where, where can we add value? Well, I was inspired to do this podcast. I've been a long-time listener to the Brilliant Founders podcast by David Sandra. And what David does is he breaks down autobiographies of the world's best founders, uh, the founders that have shaped the business world, from Jeff Bezos to Elon Musk, etc. And he really talks about the business side. And I think where, where we have our expertise is really the psychological nuances. So what I wanted to do, um, working with yourself, is you know, dive into your biographies of athletes, coaches, and performers, but really trying to uncover the secrets behind their success from a psychological point of view. That's wonderful. And I, and I think anyone that's, uh, that's interested in, in maximizing performance, getting a little bit better at what they want to do, or just, you know, overall improving their, their mental processes and their, their well-being and those sort of things, there's a wealth of information that you can learn from there. So if you're interested in, in, in joining us on this journey and, and looking to unleash your full potential, feel free to join us on exploring these psychological secrets. Don't forget to hit, uh, to click like uh, and subscribe and stay updated on every episode that we've got. So shall we jump in? Yeah, let's let's jump right in. As Beautiful. that opening paragraph says, we we kind of the the book starts with you know Andre waking up um, just before his second round match in the 2006 US Open, which is his last match. And I think this first paragraph I'm I'm going to share really dives into kind of the mental game in terms of preparation. The afternoon shower is for encouraging yourself, coaching yourself. Tennis is a sport in which you talk to yourself. No athletes talk to themselves like tennis players. Pitchers, golfers, goalkeepers, they mutter to themselves, of course. 
but tennis players talk to themselves and answer. In the heat of a match, tennis players look like lunatics in the public square, ranting, swearing, and conducting the Lincoln-Douglas debates with their alter egos. Why? Because tennis is so damn lonely. So, what do you what do you take from that, Greg? What do you think the kind of um, the individual self talk of tennis players? Well, no, knowing a few tennis players, lunatics fits the bill pretty well. Um, but, but I think if we if we really boil down to what he's talking about in terms of being a lunatic, it's that it's that the the, the process of talking to yourself. Um, and I think he's right. I, I think this is something that all athletes and all high performers, and to be perfectly honest. Everyone does. We all have that inner monologue. We've all got that sort of waterfall or cascade of, of thoughts, and those those tend to um, to manifest a little bit in, in what we say to each other and the narrative that we say. Um, but I think he, he raises an interesting point. Tennis is a unique sport. You're individual. There's no one around you. You don't have ideas to bounce off anyone. And at the end of the day, you are like like you're sitting on an island. It's so damn lonely is, is a perfect way to put it. Yeah, that's a that's a great transition. So. I'll just read a little bit more and then kind of jump in with my own ideas around self-talk. He says, only boxers can understand the loneliness of tennis players, and yet boxers have their con men and managers. Even a boxer's opponent can provide a kind of companionship, someone you can grapple with and grunt at. In tennis, you stand face-to-face -face with an enemy, trade blows with him, but never touch him or talk to him or anyone else. The rules forbid tennis players from even talking to their coach while they're on court. People sometimes mention track and field runners as a comparable lonely figure, but I have to laugh. At least a runner can smell his opponents. They're inches away. In tennis, on the other hand, of all the games men and women play, tennis is the closest to solitary confinement, which inevitably leads to self-talk. And for me, the self-talk starts here in the afternoon shower. This is when I begin to say things to myself, crazy things, over and over, until I believe them. For instance, that a quasi-cripple can compete in the US Open that a 36-year-old man can beat an opponent in his prime. I've won 869 matches in my career, fifth on the all-time list, and many of those were won during the afternoon shower. So as we can hear there, uh, you kind of spot on with that loneliness piece, um, but he's also kind of talking about his preparation and how he mm. uses self-talk as part of his preparation. I think the interesting thing there is you start to see this idea of talking to yourself as being kind of a natural process, something that everyone does. And as that paragraph starts to develop, and you mentioned preparation there, you start to see how I guess he begins to use this as a tool for performance, right? You mentioned preparation there. So it goes from kind of slides down the slope of I'm just talking to myself like a normal person. And then it's I'm starting to talk to myself with a purpose. I'm starting to try and believe these cra these crazy things, right? That he can compete, that he is an older guy on the circuit, that he can beat an opponent that's in his prime. And he's starting to use that self-talk to almost try and persuade himself into performing at his best so it's gone from this kind of loose ill-defined thing over here that everyone does starting to move that towards a tool that he can use as an expert performer when i'm working with athletes i think about it in kind of four different ways and the first one and it's kind of you can argue whether it's thought processes or self-talk it's if we think about the thoughts that pop into our head that are unconscious that we don't decide that that's kind of one kind of internal dialogue the second piece is that internal dialogue that we choose to generate for ourselves. Like we can say to ourselves, like, hey, I, I look good today, right? That's a, that's a piece of self-talk that you can say in turn. The third one that I, I like to think about with athletes is what do I say out loud? So mm. maybe it's not no longer just within my head. It's the things I'm actually going to articulate and what I'm going to say out loud, which is often what we see athletes do. And the last one is, what we say about ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a really nice way to put it. And I think all of those things you have a you have a choice whether or not you believe those stories or those things that you're saying or that those thoughts that are popping up or not. And I think the ones that you articulate and hopefully the ones that you articulate to other people, hopefully those are things that you believe and hopefully that those are things that are positive and productive and can be useful for you in your performance. Yeah, I think I think right through this book you're gonna see some contradictions. Andre has amazing self-talk at time at, at times and then other times it's incredibly you know maladaptive and uh problematic i would say and and he oscillates between the two but here as you you mentioned kind of preparing for performance he says i tell myself that tonight is an exam for which i've been studying for for 29 years whatever happens tonight i've already been through it at least once before if it's a physical test if it's a mental test it's nothing new please let this be over I don't want this to be over. I start to cry. 
I lean against the wall of the shower and let go. I give myself strict orders as I shave. Take it one point at a time. Make him work for everything. No matter what happens, hold your head up. And for God's sake, enjoy it. Or at least try and enjoy moments of it. Even the pain. Even the losing, if that's what's in store. Whew, he jumps around a little bit there. We've we've got some kind of positive stuff. Then he, you know, like with all of us, he he goes from the kind of positive self talk to more maladaptive or more difficult self talk. What what are your reflections there? Yeah, I think uh, um, it's a really interesting thing. When I when I think about self talk, I, I can kind of break it down into two to two parts. I think there's the self talk itself, and then there's contents of the self talk. So for me, self talk as a tool is just a delivery uh, modality, as you will, to 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 kind of hopefully make sense of what's going on in your head, whether that's something that you elaborate on out loud or whether that's just kind of the thoughts and the inner monologue, as it were. It's it's just a thing. It's a delivery method. What you choose to fill that plate with and what you choose from that kind of that collection of thoughts and what you choose to make sense of, that's the thing that's really under your control. So when you were reading through that through that information there, the idea of, of him getting really instructive, giving himself strict orders, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to make him work. No matter what happens, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to carry myself. It's a very instructive thing. So he's filling self-talk. The contents of his self-talk is very, very instructive, which I think if we look at if we look at high performers across the board, I think that's something that we start to see as a bit of a commonality, that they become very Absolutely. instructive. The things that they want to do and not necessarily ignoring, but not putting as much emphasis on all of the things that they don't want to do, because that is an infinite list. <laughs> Yeah, and I love how he's using it and talking. He's really, you know, pulling on his experience. Like he, I've been here before. Nothing's new. You know, he's he's giving himself those reminders. He's he's an experienced pro. He's won eight grand slams at this time. He's he's whatever's gonna come. He's done it before. There's nothing new. And I think that experience he's leaning on there. And I think that's super valuable. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of jump around a little bit, and from right. Right from the end of the book, we're going to jump to kind of the beginning of this story with Andre, especially the beginning of his tennis. And, you know, as with most young athletes, we're going we're gonna to hear about relationships with parents. It says, I'm a seven-year-old talking to myself because I'm scared and because I'm the only person who listens to me. Under my breath, I whisper, just quit, Andre. Just give up. Put your racket down. Walk off court right now. Go into the house and get something to eat. Play with Rita, Philly, or Tammy. Sit with mom while she knits or does a jigsaw puzzle. Doesn't that sound nice? Wouldn't that feel like heaven, Andre? To just quit? To never play tennis again? But I can't. So, again, we're hearing his self-talk starting um, at a very early age. And at this and at this point, he it really sounds like he's not enjoying himself and doesn't want to be playing tennis. Yeah, it sounds like that... Um that inner monologue, whether it's, it's something that he's deliberately trying to bring in or whether it's just a, a, a case of a man looking back over a long period of time and reflecting on that. I think it just shows that this is something that is going to play a role regardless of the age or the experience of the athlete. We just talked about how he's using his, his experience and, and, and all of the things that he's accomplished later in his career as a tool. But this also just shows that this self-talk is something that can, can exist really, really early on in, a, in an athlete's career. And hopefully we can harness it for for good as opposed to evil. Yeah. And he, he, he then kind of alludes to his father and he says, not only would my father chase me around the house with my racket, but something in my gut, some deep unseen muscle won't let me. I hate tennis. Hate it with all my heart. And still I keep playing. Keep hitting all morning and all afternoon because I have no choice. No matter how much I want to stop, I don't. I keep begging myself to stop and I keep playing. And this gap, this contradiction between what I want to do and what I actually do feels like the core of my life. My father yells everything twice, sometimes three times, sometimes 10. Harder, he says, harder. But what's the use? No matter how hard I hit the ball, no matter how early the ball comes back, every ball I send across the net to join the thousands that are already over on the other side of the court, not hundreds, thousands. They roll towards me in perpetual waves. I have no room to turn, to step, to pivot. I can't move without stepping on a ball. And yet, I can't step on a ball because my father won't bear it. Step on one of my father's tennis balls and he'll howl as if you stepped on his eyeball. Every third ball fired by the dragon hits a ball already on the ground, causing a crazy sideways hop. I adjust at the last second, catch the ball early and hit it smartly across the net. 
I know this is no ordinary reflex. I know there are very few children in the world that could have seen that ball, let alone hit it. But I take no pride in my reflexes, and I get no credit. It's what I'm supposed to do. Every hit is expected. Every miss is a crisis. My father says, if I hit 2,500 balls each day, I'll hit 17,500 balls each week. And at the end of the year, I'll have hit nearly a million tennis balls. He believes in math. Oh, so some interesting, interesting kind of coaching approaches there. Yeah, and 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 I think that that's that's somewhat common. You know, we can we could deep dive into some motor motor learning and motor behavior stuff if if we needed to. But I think kind of surface level. I think when we think about deliberate practice, um, it's it's really practicing with a purpose, um, and we're looking at trying to improve usually specific elements of what it is that we're actually trying to do. So when he said he's hitting um, seventeen you know seventeen thousand five hundred balls a week. Um, He's probably working on specific things, so it might be forehand, backhand, volley, whatever it is. It's not just it's not just hitting the ball for the sake of hitting the ball. It should hopefully be directed towards improving some part of performance. Yeah, I mean, I think something that we'll hear throughout these uh, podcasts will be that that concept of repetition. And without doubt, to get good at something, repetition has to be part of it. Now, repetition in itself, it doesn't have to be repetitive. Repetitive is you have that emotional. Um, connection with something and it becomes very, you know, drab and something we don't want to do. But repetition and, and doing something over and over again, whether it's whether it's, you know, kicking soccer balls or hitting tennis balls or whether it's skiing down a mountain, whatever it might be, repetition is a crucial part of a young athlete's development. And if you don't put in a lot of time, you're not going to, you know, compare to your your, your peers and you're going to have that practice deficit. So if, you know, there's other tennis players around the world that are hitting, you know, 2,500 balls a day and Andre's hitting 100, well, he's going to have a, a practice deficit. So there is an important part of repetition and there's an important part of practice that you need to be able to put in a good amount of time to get good at anything. And I think that's an important message. And I think his dad stumbled upon this and perhaps doesn't do it quite the, way, the right way but he, he is doing a lot of repetition. And he, and he moves on and he says, I often think about how I can stop thinking. I wonder if my father yells at me to stop thinking because he knows I'm a thinker by nature. Or with all this yelling, has he turned me into a thinker? Is my thinking about things other than tennis an act of defiance? I like to think so. So this is quite, uh, this kind of a matrix going on almost here. He's thinking about thinking. But there's an important point, and I think this goes across performers in general, I'd love your take on it, is this idea of, you know, I don't want to think. His dad's asking him not to think. Andre's saying, I am a thinker. And I come across this a lot with athletes who say, I, I don't want to think. Like, what's your take on that? What's your advice? I'd say that you're, um, you're, you're fighting the losing battle. As, as you mentioned, when we first started talking about self-talk, you talked about those unconscious things that just kind of pop up, right? And that is the nature of consciousness. If things are going to enter our mind and we have very, very little control over what they are, when they are, how they are. Um, so when when you when you have people talking about, hey, I want to stop thinking, usually the questions that I get is, how do I stop thinking negatively? How do I stop thinking about the things that I don't want to be thinking about? And I think it's a really honest question, but it's probably the wrong question because we can't do anything about thinking. It's not a, it's not a thought that we can just turn off. It's not a switch that we can, you know, a window that we can access out. These things are going to come into come into our consciousness, attentional space, mind, whatever you want to call that space. So I think that the important thing is is to be very selective about what it is that you choose to think about in any moment. So if, if you let's take that example of I, I want to stop thinking negatively. Well, the easiest way to stop thinking negatively is to fill the attentional space, your brain, your mind, your head, whatever you want to call it, with the opposite of that thing. So I want to start thinking positively. Now, if you start to fill that space with all of those thoughts that are useful, that are positive, that are productive, really it means that there's not a lot of space for those negative thoughts, for those other things to come in. And if you don't fill that space with thoughts, basically you create a vacuum. And what do we know about vacuums? Well, vacuums suck things in, right? So the negative thoughts, the thoughts that are popping up, the thoughts that might not be productive or useful to you, they just get sucked into that vacuum. Um, so again, like I said, it's, a, it's an honest question, but probably the wrong one. Not how do I stop thinking, but how do I start thinking about the things that are useful and positive and productive for me? So, so I think inevitably when we look at the relationship between Andre and his dad, 
there's a history there and um, his father's history is really interesting. And I think it plays into how he thinks about sport, how he thinks about developing and coaching his son. And I think there's lessons here for, for parents um, who are listening or coaches, because often your own background, you know, impacts how you go about working with other people. So a little bit about his dad. His dad was um, on the Iranian Olympic boxing team. And he went to the 1948 Games in London and then also went to the Games in Helsinki. So he was a two-time Olympian, which is nothing to be sniffed at for sure. Um, but he says, the judges, he grumbles, they were crook. The whole thing was fixed, rigged. The world was very biased against Iran. My father says that when he boxed, he always wanted to take the guy's best punch. He tells me, day one on the tennis court, when you know you just look at the other guy's best punch, or you just took the other guy's best punch, and you're still standing, and the other guy knows it, you'll rip the heart right out of him. So we've got a little bit about his dad, and um, his dad's a, a, former, a former boxer, and now he's trying to apply that idea of taking the other guy's best punch as a strategy for tennis. Yeah, I would say if you are a boxer, I'd say try and avoid your man's best punch. <laughs> I'd say that's probably um, probably fair. I think it's, uh, you know, if, if we are going down that road, I think it's a case of you would try and avoid that person's best punch, whatever that is in, in your sport. Um, but I think there's a certain confidence in that ability to be able to take that, right? And that's, that is a skill. Let's go back to boxing. We talk about boxers that aren't, they're not necessarily maybe technical or they're not maybe that sort of, that tactically savvy or, or really heavy-handed punches. But we talk about chin. Right, we talk about that ability to absorb that the, sort of the best things that come in from that other fighter, and I think that that's probably what his dad's getting to here. Is we translate that to tennis. If you're able to handle the best that your opponent has to offer, confidence-wise, focus-wise, emotionally, like that puts you in a really, really good position to play well. Now, the goal should never be able to allow you allow the, the boxer or the tennis player to throw their best punch, right? You, you probably want to be playing to the weaknesses of that, of, of trying to highlight the weaknesses of that opponent. But I think there is something to be said about being able to take that um, take that sort of that best punch or the best that's on offer from your opponent. Yeah, the, the psychological characteristic that comes to mind is resilience for me. Yeah. It's being able to absorb, you know, go up against, uh, you know, whatever your, your opponent's got to throw at you be able to take that and, and kind of bounce back. And he says here, he says, in tennis, he says the same rule. Attack the other man's strength. If the man is a server, take away a serve. If he's a power player, overpower him. If he has a big forehand, take pride in going to the forehand. Go after his forehand until he hates his forehand. My father has a special name for this contrarian, contrarian strategy. He calls it putting a blister on the other guy's brain. With this strategy... It's a brutal philosophy. He stamps me for life. He turns me into a boxer with a tennis racket. Since most tennis players pride themselves on their serve, my father turns me into a counterpuncher and a returner. And it's, it's really interesting because at this time, through the 80s and 90s, tennis was pride, predominantly about big servers. It was about people dominating with their serve. And Andre came along and his, his you know, key shot was really his return. And he was dominant from the from the baseline. So his father, early on, seeing him as this kind of counterpuncher, but going after their their strength, is a very interesting approach. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, if everyone is good at serving, what is it that I need to be really good at to maybe separate myself from the pack? Particularly if you don't have a strength in that serving. And I think identifying something that you could potentially be really, really good at. It's not a weakness, right? He probably was never a terrible returner. He was probably actually always a very good returner. And then maximizing that and making that part of his identity and part of his game plan and part of his strategy seems like a really solid way to go about it. And there's something, there's something here, um, as, as we kind of transition into the book, he starts talking about junior tournaments. And what we start to see is he has a lot of success, but there's a lot of pressure being put on Andre. And he says, I hate all the junior tournaments. I hate nationals most of all because the stakes are higher. And they're held in other states, which means airfares, motels, rental cars, restaurant meals. My father is shelling out money, investing in me. When I lose, there goes another piece of the investment. When I lose, I set back the whole Agassi clan. So we're starting to see he's really starting to feel the pressure. He's got siblings, but his father is really investing a lot of money in him. 
when we think about pressure it's it's an interesting one because it's always about what is the perception of pressure if you try and try and hold pressure or, or, or draw a circle around pressure or, or try and make pressure a really tangible thing. It's a really, really hard thing to define. It means different things to different people, but it's a word that we use very commonly. But I think what's really important is that there is, there might not actually be any pressure there, but it's about the perception of pressure that you have. So athletes taking all of this sort of this sensory information going on around them, obviously we've got parents, we've got, okay, well, hotel, rental, car, flights, this must all cost money. And those are things that add to pressure. Now, a hotel, a rental car, a flight doesn't actually add any pressure. It's about the sense that we make of that and the perception that we have and the meaning that we assign to that that actually has the impact on pressure. Yeah, without a doubt. I, th I think it, it comes down to the simplicity of messaging and what is the message, whether we're, we're trying to be implicit or explicit with our messaging, what is the messaging we're sending our athletes or what is the messaging you're receiving as an athlete? And again, it is a lot of the time around perception. So Andre, he said, if, if I could play another sport, I'd play soccer instead of tennis. I don't like sports, but if I must play a sport to please my father, I'd much rather play soccer. I get to play three times a week at school, and I love running on the soccer field with the wind in my hair, calling for the ball, knowing the world doesn't end if I don't score. The fate of my father, my family, or planet Earth doesn't rest on my shoulders. If the team doesn't win, if it's the whole, it's the whole team's fault, and no one will yell at me. Team sports, I decide, are the way to go. So we hear this a lot. What's the difference between uh, the pressure of a team sport athlete and an individual sport athlete? Well, I'm going to flip that back on you because yeah, I know you played soccer and I know you played tennis, so you've got experience of work. I, I hit tennis balls. I wouldn't say that I ever played tennis. What's, <laughs> what, was the, what was the difference for you growing up? I mean, I definitely feel with it with the team sport as many one as many listeners could attest. I think there's a there's that shared responsibility. There's very rarely when a when a team loses that it's down to one single individual. You know, even if an individual makes a mistake, if we take the game of soccer, that if an individual makes a mistake late in the game, you know, it could it could contribute to the to the loss. But it's a it's a collective responsibility. Whereas as a, as a tennis player, an individual sport athlete, there is no one else to look at. There's no one else to turn to. Now, interestingly, some athletes and some individual sport athletes I've worked with like that. They don't like relying on other people. It's that they can't control other people, so they can't mm -hmm. control the teammates. So if I play well and my teammates don't play well and they lose, they, they struggle with that. So individ some individual athletes really like that. And then there's also individual athletes that – oh, I, I'd much rather have that shared responsibility. Um, and I think it's it, it really comes down to that individual and that individual psyche of understanding how they perceive pressure and how they perceive mistakes and, you know, responsibility and how they want to, quote, unquote, control for the outcome of their performance. If we continue on that kind of soccer theme, um, in the book, Andre decides to tell his dad that he's injured and he can't practice and goes to soccer instead. And this is kind of the fallout. So suddenly I look up and I see my father. He's at the edge of the parking lot, stalking towards the field. Now he's talking to the coach. Now he's yelling at the coach. The coach is waving at me. Agassi, out of the game. I sprint off the field. As we drive home, my father says, without looking at me, you're never playing soccer again. I beg him for a second chance. I tell my father that I don't like being by myself on a huge tennis court. Tennis is lonely, I tell him. There's nowhere to hide when things go wrong. No dugout, no sideline, no neutral corner. It's just you out there, naked. He shouts at the top of his lungs. You're a tennis player. You're going to be number one in the world. You're going to make lots of money. That's the plan, and that's the end of it. I think uh, something that kind of struck me when I read this was similarities with the uh, the story of the Williams sisters and, and King Richard. I don't know if you've seen the movie with Will Smith, but... Um, definitely Richard Williams had that plan for for Venus and Serena from a very early age that they were going to be the best tennis players in the world and nothing, that was the sole purpose and the sole path that they were on. And you hear it from his dad. You're, you're a tennis player. You're going to be number one in the world. You're going to make lots of money. That's the plan. It's his plan, but, but that's the plan. And, and, that's, and that's the end of it. Um, now, th there's something there. Like how how do you take that how do you take that from a psychological point of view as a young athlete, knowing that there's someone who's driving you, that there's something there that someone believes in you and this is your path, but also 
this is your only path. You don't have a say in it. There, there's a lack of autonomy there. So I think it could be seen as a good thing where there is a person that has a plan and is preparing the path for Agassi or for the athlete here, trying to help them develop and has a really clear understanding of what it is and what it is that he wants to do and how he wants to do it and has a grand vision. On the other side of things, that is a ton of pressure for someone that is young, trying to figure out who they are, trying to establish their identity, trying to find their way in a in a social world with people of their own age and people of their own stage of development and those kind of things. No mention of friends yet, which is interesting. So that there doesn't seem to be a big social scene for him. Um, so it's it, the, the thing that really strikes me for, for for youth athletes and the development of youth athletes is, yes, but at what cost? Yeah, I mean, I think a... Uh... A very well-known psychological theory that we can attach this is self-determination theory. And, and just to break it down very simplistically for the audience, if, if you're not familiar, there's really kind of three components. It's, it's competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And competence is really, you know, is the individual feeling like they're good at something? And I think for Andre, you know, his dad's constantly critiquing him. I think he recognizes he's good at tennis, but his dad's constantly critiquing him and giving him that negative feedback. If, if we look at um, autonomy, he, he doesn't have any choice in what he's doing. He wants to be doing other things, but is not allowed. And that relatedness, there's very few um, mentions of friends. That He doesn't seem to have a big social circle. There doesn't seem to be that connection with others. And, and that's probably what he you know was getting a little bit from soccer. So when we don't have those three components, I, th I think it can make you know development and motivation you know very poor. And ultimately, we want to make sure that our athletes have components of self-determination and, and have that desire to continue to compete. One, one thing his dad did realize around the age of 14, his dad realized, and we're jumping around a little bit, but that, that's the whole purpose is we're not going to go through the whole book, otherwise that's called Audible. So if you want the Audible, buy the book. So, but when, he, when he's 14, um, Andre's dad realizes that he can no longer coach him, that he's probably reached the peak of his, his ability. So he identifies um, a, a tennis academy. Uh, Nick Bollettieri, who's a Hall of Fame tennis coach, had a, an academy in Bradenton, Florida. And he sends Andre to uh, the Bollettieri Tennis Academy very much against Andre's will. He, he does not want to go. And um, we're not going to go too much into it. But I think we, we start to hear the first signs of kind of Agassi understanding the mental game, but also he's then thrust into an incredibly competitive environment around other people. So he says, when we're not drilling, we're studying the psychology of tennis. We take classes on mental toughness, positive thinking and visualization. We're taught to close our eyes and picture ourselves winning Wimbledon, hosting that gold trophy above our heads. Then we go to aerobics or weight training or out to the crush shell track where we run until we drop. The constant pressure, the cutthroat competition, the total lack of adult supervision, it slowly turns us into animals. A kind of jungle law prevails. It's Karate Kid with rackets. It's Lord of the Flies with forehands. So we hear that he's now in a, an academy around other kids, but he's not painting an incredibly you know, nice picture of it. But you do hear he's starting to understand or he's starting to get lessons in the psychology of his sport. Yeah, I think that's the that's the important thing about the mental game is that yeah, you can kind of stumble your way into making sense of these things and and figuring things out for yourself, and much in the same way that you could do that with with any particular topic, right? Any any study yeah, study any subject at school, you could figure your way through it. But when we're talking about deliberately doing something, and this kind this is kind of like deliberate practice, right? Is using people with expertise and using people that have an understanding helps you to make sense of that, but also helps to potentially expedite the process. If you think about the, the, the development of an athlete, particularly youth athlete, it's a very, very short window of time. And yeah. I think you'll, you will probably vehemently agree with me here that as talent in terms of physical, technical, tactical ability improves, mental performance doesn't necessarily go for that ride. It isn't necessarily part of that journey unless it's deliberately taken on that journey it's almost like something that you've got to pack in your suitcase and take with you so getting a, you know my my advice to anyone who's who's interested in improving their, their mental performance is to try and find ways to deliberately develop and pay attention to and strengthen and improve and evolve and all of those different words that are basically synonymous for the same thing 
your mental game that can be positive and beneficial for your performance. A ton of information out there. You can find you can find podcasts just like this one. You can find books. You can find articles, YouTube clips. Then, but probably the best way to expedite that process is to work with people that have this expertise that can help you make sense, can help you um, expedite that process. Yeah, and I, I think there's something he's been thrust into this incredibly competitive environment, and it's kind of you know make or break. Jungle law prevails. Karate kids with rackets. And we hear we hear a little bit of conversation between Nick and his dad. He's yelling, Mr. Agassi, Nick Bollettieri here. Right, right. Well, listen to me. I'm going to tell you something very important. Your boy has more talent than anyone I've ever come through this academy. That's right, ever. And I'm going to take him to the top. My heart sinks. You know my father can't resist anything free. My fate is sealed. Nick hangs up, spins towards me in his chair. He doesn't explain. He doesn't console. He doesn't ask if this is what I want. He doesn't say a thing besides, go back to the courts. The warden has tacked several years onto my sentence, and there's nothing to be done about it. But pick up my hammer and return to the rock pile. So again, what I, I feel here, at 14, he's, he's again got a complete lack of autonomy in his decision making. It's decisions made by adults between Nick and his father that Andre's going to stay here. Nick's going to take him to number one in the world. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, I think I think that lack of autonomy is is hugely important. But it, it doesn't even sound like he had a say, let alone a decision to be able to make. I think any input that that, um, that was potentially on the table got very very quickly stripped away between that conversation. Um, and I think what we're starting to see here is maybe the the um, kind of the the development of this being a job for him like something that is starting to become a grind. Like when you think about, you know, kind of that prison sentence in the water and, and, you know, hitting rocks every day and breaking rocks every day, that's a grind. It's monotonous. It's not enjoyable. It's not really something anyone really aspires to, I, I, I would imagine. Um, and you've got to think, okay, well, what impact is that actually going to have on his performance? Is it going to be a good thing? Is it going to be a bad thing? Um, and ultimately what impact is it going to have on him? Yeah, and the, the impact is really, the impact on him psychologically is probably, played out in these next couple of paragraphs and how and Andre starts to act out while he's at the Bolletieri Academy. He says, the worse I do in school, the more I rebel. I drink, I smoke pot, I act like an ass. I'm dimly aware of the inverse ratio between my grades and my rebellion, and I don't dwell on it. I prefer Nick's theory. He says, I don't do well in school because I have a hard-on for life. It might be the only thing he's ever said to me that's halfway accurate. He typically describes me as a cocky showboarder, who likes the limelight. Even my father knows me better than that. My general demeanor does feel like a hard-on, violent, involuntary, unstoppable. And so I accept it as I accept many changes in my body. I've mutilated my hair, grown my nails, including one pinky nail that's two inches long and painted fire engine red. I've pierced my body, broken ribs, busted curfew, picked fist fights, thrown tantrums, cut classes, even slipped into the girls' barracks at night. I consume gallons of whiskey, often while sitting brazenly on top of my bunk, and as an extra dash of audacity, I built a pyramid of those dead soldiers, a three-foot tower of empty Jack Daniels bottles. I chew tobacco, hardcore weed like Skull and Kodiak, soaked in whiskey. After losses, I stick a plump-sized wad inside of my cheek. The bigger the loss, the bigger the wad. What rebellion is left? What new sin can I commit to show the world I'm unhappy and want to go home? So what we have here is, you know, obviously teenage, teenage rebellion and really wanting to get kicked out of the Bolletieri Academy. But we start to see that kind of identity. He's, he's, he's struggling with his own identity and his own look and who he is as a person. You know, give a man an inch and he'll take a mile, right? So he hasn't, he hasn't had that space to explore and figure out who he is and develop that identity under his under his dad's tutelage, you know, which has been very, a very controlled environment and very, very much driven by that. Now it's the law of the jungle. There are no rules. There are no boundaries. There are no guardrails. There is just this kind of collection of Lord of the Flies that have been thrown together and it's, it's jungle rules. Yeah. And he, he's going through those kind of that, that contradiction in himself at the same time, he's, he's still competing and he's still developing. He's still one of the best junior tennis players in the U S and we now hear in the book, he's, through the kind of 14 to 16, he's transitioning and has some decisions to make. And he, he turns up at a tournament and 
for the for the listeners if you if you you can compete as an amateur in professional tennis tournaments but once you take money any prize money you then have to transition into being a professional and and there's a section here which really kind of seals his fate he says i tell the tournament director i'll take the money as the words leave my mouth i feel a shelf of possibilities fall away i don't know what those possibilities might be but that's the point i will never know the man hands me a check and as i walk out of his office I feel as if I'm starting down a long, long road, one that seems to lead to a dark, ominous forest. It's April 29th, 1986, my 16th birthday. In disbelief all day long, I tell myself, you're a professional tennis player now. That's what you are. That's who you are. No matter how many times I say it, it doesn't feel right. And I think it comes, I think what sticks out for me there as as this identity has formed around him, or he's formed this identity around himself of tennis is 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 who I am, and we, we you know we talk a lot about tennis is what you do, it's not who you are, or the sport you do is what you do, not who you are. And right here, he's made that commitment. Once he takes that check, it's kind of that 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 you know pole in the sand, whatever you might say, the flag in the sand, whereby he now there's no way to go back. He's committed. He's a professional tennis player. The choices he may have, which he doesn't have a lot because he's not doing great in school, but whatever choices he may have had, they've disappeared. So I think it's a really interesting moment. It, it makes that transition in the book from being a kind of a rebellious child into now he's a professional tennis player at 16 years of age. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting things in there. I think there's the there's the kind of the two parts. There's, there's the profession of tennis which I think he'd kind of always been doing, <laughs> yeah. right? Seeing things as a job and working really hard. And then there is being a professional, which is that kind of that identity and identifying with, uh, it feels like he'd always booked the, really wanted to try and buck the idea of it being a profession, but now he is a professional. I think the other thing that you, that you mentioned there, which I think you hit the nail right on the head it, there, is that when we aren't the things that we do, um, conversations that I have with with coaches and with, with players of, and, and athletes in all different sports is, when I ask them what they do for a living, they might say, oh, I'm a tennis coach or I'm a soccer coach or I'm a, I'm a golfer. And while that is true, the, the way that I like to try and challenge them to start thinking about themselves is that they're not that thing. They are a person that coaches golf, that coaches soccer, that plays tennis. And always, you know, start to kind of have that person-centered language around who they are and their identity. Um, I think there's long-term implications of that, not necessarily identifying with what you do so much that it becomes so much of a part of your identity and career transition, but we're jumping the gun there a little bit. But as soon as you start to recognize and, and, and start to think about yourself and your identity and your structure in a slightly different way, that can be more positive. Very much here, he is identifying as a professional tennis player, not as a person that plays professional tennis. Uh, and I, I think obviously that has, that has positive and negative impacts as he goes through his career. Yeah, we'll, we'll absolutely touch on kind of fame and how fame um, also plays into that. I, I think there's this really interesting paragraph I pulled out with regards to playing down to your opponent. And I think this this concept um, can really resonate with people who are listening. So I, I'd love your take on this. He says he, he's he's now a professional and he's he's playing, I think, on the challenger level, which is the level before ATP. And he says, my opponent is bad which puts me at a disadvantage. I'm at my worst against lesser opponents. I play down to their level. I don't know how to maintain my game while adjusting for my opponent, which feels like inhaling and exhaling at the same time. Against great players, I rise to the challenge. Against bad players, I press, which in tennis terms means not letting, go of th not letting things flow. Pressing is one of the deadliest things you can do in tennis. So this concept of playing down to your opponent's level. I'm sure you've seen that in your time working with athletes. I'd love your take on that. I've probably done it as well as a, <laughs> as a play, playing in my, my sporting career. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's Taylor's oldest time. And, and from a psychological standpoint, there's a, there's a couple of different things that come into play here. When, when you're playing against that, le that lesser opponent, there is that idea of I should beat this person. So already before we're going in, there's the expectation or the maybe the added level of pressure that you should beat that that person. There's a couple of different ways that you can approach that. 
you could see that as well. I should beat this opponent. I'm going to go out there and do my best and absolutely just blow them off court. I'm going to go and do what he does against the the good players. Um, almost kind of, I'm going to go and prove that I am in fact better than this player. But where the negative side of this comes in, where, where this can be very detrimental is that, well, I'm not going to try that hard because I should beat this opponent. I don't have to have my best stuff. I am better than this person. And my natural talent and my natural ability is just going to shine through and I'm going to be able to get through. On the other side of that, is if I don't try my best or I don't bring my best stuff or I don't work as hard as I should or put in that effort, if I do end up getting beaten by that person who's less than me, who's not as good as me, I've got a ready-made pre-baked excuse for why I didn't win that game. I didn't try. I wasn't bringing my best stuff. It was, yeah, yeah, you, you just caught me on a day where I couldn't really be bothered. And that gives you a really, a really soft say, psychological safety net to be able to land in when that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you summarized it really well, and I'll just kind of put a bow on it. And I think what we're talking about here is expectations. And the language you, we use around expectations are, I should, I have to, I need to, I must. And when we talk with that language, the expectation mindset, it invites pressure onto our, ourselves. And there's a lot of shoulds. I should do this, I should do this, I need to, I must, I have to. And it's very common when we hear that with athletes is how do we, how do we change that language into what I would say is a goal-setting mindset which is what do I want to achieve? What can, what will I achieve as opposed to I should? So it's a really a quick switch from an expectation mindset to a more goal setting mindset. So as we, as we move forward, he's, he's growing some fame as he's starting to be more successful. And obviously he dresses a little bit differently and we're starting to see kind of his identity shine through. He says in 1987 in Portland, Oregon, I was playing in the Nike international challenge and Nike reps invited me up to a hotel suite to show me their latest demos and clothing samples. McEnroe was there, of course, and he was given first choice. He held up a pair of denim shorts and said, what the fuck are these? My eyes got big. I licked my lips and thought, whoa, those are cool. If you don't want those, Mac, I've got dibs. The mobile Mac set them aside. I scooped them up. Now I wear them at all my matches, as do countless fans. Sports writers murder me for it. They say I'm trying to stand out. In fact, as in my mohawk, I'm trying to hide. They say I'm trying to change the game. In fact, I'm trying to prevent the game from changing me. They call me a rebel, but I have no interest in being a rebel. I'm only conducting an everyday run-of-a-mill teenage rebellion. Subtle distinctions, but important. At heart, I'm doing nothing more than being myself. And since I don't know who that is, my attempts to figure it out are scattershot and awkward at best, and often contradictory. I'm doing nothing more than I did at the Bolletieri Academy, booking authority, experimenting with identity, sending a message to my father, thrashing out against the lack of choice in my life, but I'm doing it on a grander stage. I can't imagine all these people trying to be Andre Agassi, since I don't want to be Andre Agassi. I think that's one of my favorite paragraphs in the book. Uh, he just, McEnroe sets aside a pair of denim shorts and uh, I guess he picks them up and, and sees them completely differently. Like, whoa, these are awesome. Um, but as you hear... He's... The question is, and this is what everyone who seems <laughs> listening wants to know, is did you have a pair of those shorts growing up as a tennis player? I always wanted them. I, I, I never got them. They also had, uh, they had some, what, the, the tight kind of Lycra shorts underneath and my legs... The, the neon colors? Just, <laughs> they, they never. My, my legs were too skinny. They never. Uh, they never filled the uh, cycling shorts underneath. <laughs> Man, that's an opportunity missed. I would have paid money to see that photo. <laughs> so he he's pretty aware of of that identity piece. He's trying to figure himself out. Obviously, he's still a young a young man at this stage. And one of the one of the, kind of a key moment in in the setting of an image is, um, he he gets hired on by one of his big corporate sponsors, Canon, to do a photo shoot. The driver puts me in a white suit and then drives me up to the front portico in a white Lamborghini. Step out of the car, he says. Turn to the camera, lower your sunglasses and say, image is everything. Image is everything? Yes, image is everything. Overnight, the slogan becomes synonymous with me. Sports writers liken me to my inner nature, my essential being. They say it's my philosophy, my religion, and they predict it's my epitaph. They say I'm nothing but image. I have no substance because I haven't won a slam. They say that sl the slogan is proof that I'm just a pitchman, trading on my fame, caring only about money and nothing about tennis. Fans of my matches begin taunting me with the slogan, Come on, Andre, image is everything. This ubiquitous slogan, the wave of hostility and criticism and sarcasm it sets off is excruciating. 
I feel betrayed by the advertising agency and Canon execs, the sports writers, the fans, I feel abandoned. So I, I remember that commercial. <laughs> I remember the images, everything. And, and I think if you ask people growing up what they remember about Andre Agassi, images, everything is something that was, was front and center. And again, it's that, that persona that was put out there. But in reality, he's saying, that's nothing like me. I don't want to be the, the guy with the, you know, driving the white Lamborghini and I'm all about image. He's, he's saying I'm the complete opposite. I think, first of all, props. That's a, that's a great slogan for a camera company. Yeah. Image is everything. That's phenomenal. But yeah, it, it's an interesting one because it's, it's, again, him wrestling with what is and what isn't authentic with him. Yeah, and I think that lack of control kind of leads into this next kind of phase of his career where he starts to surround himself by the people he wants to be around on a daily basis and the term potentially is entourage. Um, but really, he, he was probably one of the first out on the circuit to surround himself with a lot of people. And he says, if I must play tennis, the loneliest spot, then I'm sure as hell I'm going to surround myself with as many people as I can off court. And each person will have a specific role. Sports writers rip me about my entourage. They say I travel with all these people because it feeds my ego. They say I need this many people around me because I can't be alone. That's half right. I don't like to be alone. But these people around me aren't my entourage. They're my team. I need them for company, for counsel, and for the kind of rolling education. They're my crew, but also my gurus, my blue ribbon panel. I study them and steal from them. And I think this concept... I think I've seen it throughout sport and that transition is that whether you're in an individual sport or not, nobody does it alone. That everybody on their, on their way to the top needs a team of people around them, even if they're in an individual sport. This is a way for him to get that social support, but social support with a purpose, right? It isn't just, it's not just people hangers on, like people that are feeding his ego. It's people that have specific purposes and specific roles and hopefully some clarity within those roles that can help advance him in the right direction. I love that idea of a rolling education. It's rolling as in continuous, but it's rolling as in like a travel suitcase, right? These people will travel and be, be part of what I'm doing, but rolling also being that like constant education. I think one of the key people in, in his life and, and a key key person that, that becomes part of his entourage is the, a gentleman named Gil Reyes. And, and Gil is a, his strength and conditioning coach. And a, there's a, just a, a beautiful exchange between the two of them that I want to share. He says, I tried to tell Gil about my psyche. I start at the beginning, the central truth. He laughs. You don't actually hate tennis, he says. I do, Gil. I really do. He looks at my face. And I wonder if he's thinking they might have quit his job at UNLV too soon. If that's true, he says, why play? I'm not suited for anything else. I don't know how to do anything else. Tennis is the only thing I'm qualified for. Also, my father would have a fit if I did anything else. Gil scratches his ear. This is a new one for him. He's known hundreds of athletes, and he's never known one that hated athletics. He doesn't know what to say. I reassure him. There's nothing to be said. I don't understand it myself. I can only tell him how it is. I'd love your response to this bit because I think we have the the kind of forming of a new father figure. And this is Gil's response. He says, Andre, I won't ever try and change you because I've never tried to change anybody. If I could change somebody, I'd change myself. But I know I can give you structure and a blueprint to achieve what you want. There's a difference between a plow horse and a race horse. You don't treat them the same. You hear all this talk about treating people equally, but I'm not sure equal means the same. As far as I'm concerned, you're a race horse and I'll always treat you accordingly. I'll be firm, but fair. I'll lead, never push. I'm not one of those people who expresses or articulates feelings very well. But from now on, just know this. It's on, man. It is on. You know what I'm saying? You're in a fight, and you can count on me until the last man is standing. Somewhere up there is a star with your name on it. I might not be able to help you find it, but I've got pretty strong shoulders, and you can stand on my shoulders while you're looking for that star. You hear? For as long as you want, stand on my shoulders and reach, man, reach. Oh, I, I think that's incredibly powerful. I'd, I'd love your kind of response to that. After yeah, so everything we've read, that's quite a hot and paragraph to, to listen to. And I think it speaks to a couple of points. I think the first one is Gil's recognition that everyone is different and everyone needs to be treated in a, in a different way. You know, it goes back to my original point of his dad yelling at him and not necessarily knowing if that's the right way to get something get something out of him. You know, Gil talks about plow horse and a race horse and he, 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 treating people equally doesn't necessarily mean treating people the same. I think that's hugely important, figuring out what 
this person needs in order to perform at their best. I think the second thing is the use of we and the use of where, as in um, we are, um, that collectiveness. Now this is a team effort. This is not just Andre being isolated, being an individual in an individual sport. Everything's on him, the whole pressure. I think that's a really important thing, even if it's just a, even if it's just a ling- almost a linguistic trick, that feeling, that sense of together, that togetherness, that collectiveness. He's got his entourage, but now he's got someone that's really trying to harness the power of that and push it forward. And I think the third point is that last sen- that last sentence that you said: "For as long as you want, stand on my shoulders and reach, man, reach." And I think that's really quite literally literal and quite figurative in the sense of support, like standing on my shoulders for literal support, but also knowing that he is there for support to try and help propel him to the to the the heights that he wants to reach for. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that father figure and that support is absolutely essential. And and what you see as after he meets and connects with girl, his his career really takes off. He's now you know one of the best tennis players in the world. The book transitions. He's he's starting to make Grand Slam finals now. And his first Grand Slam final is the French Open against Andre Gomez, who's an Ecuadorian, a veteran player. And there's a kind of a funny bit in the book that Andre at this time is wearing a hairpiece because he's going bald, but he has these long bleach blonde hair, and uh, he's wearing a hairpiece. And the thing, all he's worried about is his hairpiece and it not falling out on the court. Warming up before the match, I pray not for a win but for my hairpiece to stay on. Under normal circumstances, playing in my first final of a slam, I'd be tense, but my tenuous hairpiece has me catatonic. Of course, my game plan is fatally flawed from the start. Pathetic, really. It couldn't work, no matter how long the match was, because you can't win a final of a slam by playing not to lose or waiting for your opponent to lose. My attempt to orchestrate long rallies merely emboldens Gomez. He's a veteran who knows that this might be his last shot at a slam. The only way to beat him is to take away his belief and his desire by being aggressive. When he sees me playing conservative, orchestrating instead of dominating, it gives him heart. And he goes on and loses to Gomez. Gomez, um, as a veteran, becomes a, a legend in Ecuador. The thing that really does stand out for me is this this um, playing to playing not to lose as opposed to playing to win. So what we call this if we're working with an athlete is you know, what we call a need to achieve or a need to avoid failure. And when we have athletes that really harness and embrace that need to achieve and that desire to continue to push, they basically complete the behaviors that Agassi talked about earlier that aren't pressing, right? Pressing would be that orchestrating instead of dominating, which is that need to avoid failure. I'm just trying not to lose. I think in the vernacular, you'd call it playing safe, right? And we know that's not where peak performance lives. We know that peak performance players on that that quest for mastery, that quest for um, not dominating, but demonstrating what it is that you can do and really trying to play the very, very highest, highest levels of your game, right? So that need to achieve versus that need to avoid failure, it starts to free things up. And I don't just mean physically or technically or tactically, but mentally it starts to free me up because I have the, the, clear, the clarity in my mind, much like that negative and positive thinking. If I'm thinking about the things and I'm trying to do the things that I need to do to win, then the, the things that kind of can come in and be a distraction that are there to help me avoid losing. They don't have the real estate to really come in and, and steal resources from me. Yeah, and it, it, we, we hear exactly the same uh, circumstances. In 1990, he plays in the US Open against Pete Sampras. There's just kind of a couple of sentences here, and he says, then instead of me thinking how I can win, I begin to think about how I can avoid losing. It's the same mistake I made against Gomez with the same result, and he loses against Sampras. And then in the French Open in 91, he plays Jim Courier, one of the kids he actually grew up with at the Bolgeri Academy. And he says, I can't explain it any other way. In the fourth set, I lost the will, but now I've lost the desire. As certain as I felt about victory at the start of match, now it's as certain as I feel about defeat. I want it. I long for it. I say it under my breath. Let it be fast. Since losing is death, I'd rather it fast than slow. So, again, these these first few major matches, he is struggling big time. He's playing to avoid losing. He's he's lost motivation. He's just really struggling psychologically to play at this highest level. But really, his breakthrough comes. And for for those that know anything about Andre's stories, the 1992 Wimbledon final, 
and and it's actually grass is is probably his least favorite surface being a return out was a surface for big servers and the place that he never felt comfortable it's it's very pretentious and it's all white clothing and there was a, a a big controversy leading up whether Andre would wear all white, et cetera, et cetera. But he, he has a phenomenal run and makes it through to the Wimbledon final. And I think there's just some great psychology. So we'll dive in a little deeper here. And he's playing um, a Croatian, Goran Ivanisevic. And we're going to jump to the fifth set. So it's it's been the Titanic battle. And it says, as the fifth set begins, I run in place to get the blood flowing. And I tell myself one thing, you want this. You do not want to lose. Not this time. The problem in the last three slams was that you didn't want it enough and therefore you didn't bring it. But this one, you want it. So this time you need to let Ivan Isovich and everyone else in this joint know you want it. So we, we hear a very different internal dialogue as he starts the fifth set. Anything to kind of reflect on here? I think the important thing is that he didn't not want the other slams. Like, But I think he's, he's starting to harness the way that he talks to himself and his thought process and really direct it towards clarity of purpose here yeah and he says now even if is serving four five he double faults twice he's down love 30 he's cracking under the strain i haven't broken this guy in an hour and a half and now he's breaking himself he misses another first serve he's coming apart and i know it i see it no one knows better than me what it looks like to come apart i also know how it feels i know precisely what's happening inside even body his throat is closing, his legs are quivering, but then he quiets his body and hits a second serve to the back of the box, a beam of yellow light that barely nicks the line. A puff of chalk shoots up as it hits the line like an assault rifle. Then he hits another unreturnable serve. Suddenly, it's 30 all. He misses another first serve, makes the second. I crush a return. He hits a half volley. I run in and pass him and start the long walk back to the baseline. I tell myself, you can win this thing with one swing, one swing. You've never been this close. You may never be here again. Oh, so right now we have match point, but you hear kind of the psychology. What I what I brought out of this is with, with hearing him identify the psychology in his opponent. And I think that's a really important point for our listeners. Often we where the psychology tends to be very internal. We're thinking about ourselves and how we're managing. But the reality is we're, we're usually up against an opponent or, a, you know, a group of opponents, and there's a psychology on the other side. So anything to kind of pick up on that piece? Yeah, I think it's a fine line navigating that is you need to be paying attention to yourself and what you can control. But there are moments when you need to be able to kind of have that theory of mind and, and be able to get into the head of the opponent and understand what's going on with them as well. You don't want to spend too much time there because you're playing this infinite game of moving yeah. backwards and forwards with, <laughs> backwards and forwards between the two. And you can't control what, they, what they're thinking or their processes, but having an understanding of what's going on under the hood with them, that can be hugely important. The thing that I really like about this is, and I, I like that last sentence that you said, I, I don't like it as it gets towards the end of the sentence. He says, you can win this thing with one swing. One swing. You've never been this close. You may never be again. Let's get rid of the, you've never been this close, you may never be again. Let's throw that out there. But you can win this with one swing, one swing. When you think about what he's trying to do, he's trying to win Wimbledon, trying to win a, win a Grand Slam. And, and let's face it, the Grand Slam, right? If you could, if you could win, that's, that's what you want. And that's a big thing. That is a huge, huge thing. Psychologically, that's a big deal. One swing, that's not a big deal. That's very digestible. That's very manageable. Yeah. It's very controllable. So taking this, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time, right? <laughs> That's the one bite at this big elephant that is not only a Grand Slam, but also Wimbledon. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what he meant there in that moment, but I think that's a really, really useful tool for anyone who's listening. Big things that might seem like they're unmanageable are just maybe out of the realm of possibility. Identify what the first one, one swing is and complete that one swing and then move on to the next and then move on to the next. And like I said, eat that elephant one bite at a time. Yeah, and you'll hear a little bit more here. And I think this is so crucial. And I'll go into a little detail because it is his it is his first Grand Slam. He says, now the crowd rises. I call time. I have to talk to myself aloud, saying, win this point or I'll never let you hear the end of it, Andre. Don't hope he double falls. Don't hope he misses. You control what you can control. Return this serve with all your strength. And if you return it hard but miss, you can live with that. You can survive. 
one return, no regrets, hit harder. He tosses the ball, serves to my backhand. I jump in the air, swing with all my strength, but I'm so tight the ball to his backhand side has mediocre pace. Somehow he misses an easy volley. His ball smacks the net, and just like that, after 22 years and 22 million swings of a tennis racket, I'm the 1992 Wimbledon champion. I fall to my knees. So again, we have kind of that dichotomy in his self-talk. Some, some of it we probably love, some of it we probably don't love so much. But the bit that stood out for me is that, you know, return it with all your strength. And if you can return it and, and do, do your absolute best, you can live with that. Like you can survive. If you give it everything you've got, you can survive. And he says, no regrets, hit harder. That's the bit that stands out. It's that the opposite to how he was trying to play in the French Open and the US and again in the US Open is that that willingness to go for it in that big moment there's a lot of things a lot of things at play here but in these pressure moments and this is sort of the pinnacle of pressure for tennis players right is having a clear idea of what it is that you want to do as opposed to what you don't want to do so he talks about don't double fault don't hope he misses but what is it that he can do he can return he can hit it harder he can return with all his strength he can he can lean on his own performance the things that he can control once he has a clear understanding of what it is he's trying to do, it's always easier to align your behaviors to that thing. I'm supposed to be a different person now that I've won a slam, but I don't feel that Wimbledon has changed me. I feel, in fact, as if I've been let in on a dirty little secret. Winning changes nothing. Now that I've won a slam, I know something that very few people on earth are permitted to know. A win doesn't feel as good as a loss feels bad, and a good feeling doesn't last as long as a bad not even close yeah and i think that we're, we're constantly trying to pursue that next good feeling and those next good feelings don't last particularly long that idea of what's referred to as the hedonic treadmill right that we're we're always looking for that, those things and you know you climb the mountain you reach the summit a lot of the times it's okay well what now yeah ab absolutely there's a there's another key figure in the book that really takes Andre's game to the next level. I think this is worth worth digging into. The the coach and some of you will be familiar with Brad Gilbert. Um, he's he's a commentator now, well known, well known coach, a former pro, um, author of a book called Winning Ugly, which is a fantastic book. Um, one of the first kind of sports psych books I ever read, and um, he really brings up this concept of perfectionism. And and I think I'd love to hear your points on on and how you think about perfectionism because I think a lot of our listeners will will probably struggle with this to a degree. You always try and be perfect, he says, and you always fall short. It fucks with your head. Your confidence is shot. And perfectionism is a reason. You try and hit a winner on every ball. You just need to be steady, consistent, meat and potatoes. You're enough to win ninety percent of the time. Stop thinking about yourself in your own game. And remember, the guy on the other side of the net has weaknesses. Attack his weaknesses. You don't have to be the best in the world every time that you go out there. You just have to be better than one guy. Instead of succeeding, make him fail. Better yet, let him fail. So what are your thoughts on this concept of kind of trying to be perfect? Because I think a lot of people, you know, through performance, athletes or, or performers out on a stage or a coach, they seek to be perfect. So when I when I talk to athletes and, and, and performers about perfectionism, the first thing I ask them is, well, if you're a perfectionist, tell me about something that you've done that was perfect. And they find it really, really actually hard to come up with something that they've done perfect. So you can't, by definition, be a perfectionist if you haven't done something perfect, because a perfectionist is someone that did something perfect all the time. Yeah, and, and Gilbert, that kind of leads in perfectly. Gilbert, you know, he has a line, he says, about five times a year, you wake up and you're perfect when you can't lose to anybody. But it's not about those five times a year that make you a tennis player. And we, we talk about that with athletes. It's, you know, there's those few days where you wake up and, and everything's going to go right. But that's not what a career is based on. A career mm. based on your average and how good can you get your average up. Um, but I, again, I that, that noble pursuit of perfectionism, I always think about that noble pursuit of excellence. How do, how do, we, mm. how do we pursue excellence as opposed to perfectionism? As we as the book goes forward, we're not going to get into every kind of every match. There's a lot. There's a lot of tennis in there. You know, he he wins Wimbledon in '92. He wins the U.S. Open. He wins the Australian Open in in '95. And then in 1996, kind of the wheels really start to come off for him. Kind of come off the wheels come off the track, kind of personally and professionally. 
So despite kind of winning the Olympics, um, which sounds like, well, the, the wheels are coming off the track and he wins the Olympics. But 96 is where we start to kind of see a crack in his armor. He wins, he wins the gold medal against uh, Spaniard Sergei Bruguera. And, and I'll just kind of read this because it kind of gives us full circle back to his dad. He's standing on the podium here for context, and, and he's got the gold medal hanging around his neck. He says, I look for my father, but he's hiding. He told me the night before that he's managed to reclaim something taken from him years ago, and yet he doesn't want to be visible. He doesn't want it to detract from the specialness of my moment. He doesn't understand that this moment is special precisely because it's not mine. And what I liked about that is, you know, I think Andre's quite, you know, I'd say um, critical of his father throughout the book. But there's obviously a deep love and deep care for him. And he, he wins that gold medal on the sole purpose to give it for his dad because he's going through some stuff in 96 and he's struggling. He's struggling in his marriage. He's struggling with his own mental health, wins the gold medal, but he's doing it for his dad. And I really like that connection. And I think kind of just to just to move on from this, as you see where his mind is at, he says, after the Olympics, a few weeks later, I'm on the court in Cincinnati, losing my mind, playing for myself again, smashing my racket in a fit of rage. I go on to win the tournament, however, which seems laughable and only aggravates my sense that this is all a joke. So he's really struggling here. Um, he's married to Brooke Shields at the time, a famous actress many of you all have heard of. Um, but the marriage isn't going so well, and he's really feeling depressed, and things are not going well. He also um, dabbles in um, kind of self-masochism and starts to take drugs with one of his, one of his high school friends. Um, back from Las Vegas, so he's really in a in a bad place. He's struggling from his and his mental health side of things. And again, I, th I think there's something in the story, Greg, but I I don't think it's really pertinent to this this podcast to dive too deep into the kind of the drug taking, the marriage, the 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 low parts. But it is to recognize that back in back in '96, mental health was not something people came out and talked about. You know, obviously, with with Andre and Andre's stories, he's going through those challenges. He, you know, his his ranking tennis is not a priority anymore. Um, he's going through a lot of difficult times, and his ranking drops to 141 in the world. And this is this is a moment where it's really what what we'd call a rebirth story. So there's this concept, and I'm not sure if you've ever read the book by Christopher Booker, and it's called uh, the Seven Basic Plots Why We Tell Stories. And one of the seven plots is is the rebirth story. So it's where where a, a, an event changes the main character in the story and helps them become a better person. And I really think in this moment when Andre is at his lowest is that rebirth story. And that is really the second half of his career that we get to see him. You know, he remarries. He wins three more Grand Slams. Um, actually, he wins five more Grand Slams. He really comes back and, and it's a, a big change in the story. So... If anyone, if anyone's interested, I'd suggest to to read the book. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. In in 1999, the French Open, he's won the other three Grand Slams. So he's won Wimbledon, the US, and Australian Open, and it's called a career Grand Slam, whereby you win all four of the major Grand Slams. And um, he's never won the French. Of course, he's lost a couple of times. He lost to lost to Courier, lost to Andre Gomez, and he has an opportunity. He's playing. Um, Andre Medvedev, a uh, a really talented Ukrainian player, and he's struggling, and he's he's up against it, and he's luckily there's these kind of key moments potentially in people's lives, and he's he's lost the first set six one, the rain starts to fall, he's he's absolutely out of the match, getting killed, and the rain starts to fall, so he gets to go to the locker room, and I I love this, he's he's in the locker room, and he's with Brad Gilbert, and he says, I yell at Brad, he says, are you kidding me? Are you going to pick this moment of all moments to decide not to talk? Of all the times, this is the moment you're finally going to shut the hell up. He stares, and then he starts screaming. Brad, who never raises his voice to anyone, comes apart. What do you want me to say, Andre? What is it that you want me to say? You want me to tell you he's too good? How the fuck would you know? You can't judge how good he's playing. You're so confused out there. You're so blind with panic. I'm surprised you can even see him. Too good? You're making him look good. Just start letting it go. If you're going to lose, at least lose on your turn. 
hit the fucking ball. But if you're not going to hit, if you're not sure where to hit it, here's an idea. Just hit it to the same place he hits it. If he hits a backhand cross court, you hit a backhand cross court. Just hit it the same or a little bit better. I love this idea from Brad that you've just got to make it simple. And he's, he's, he's in this tight moment and you've got to make it simple. One of my uh, favorite quotes comes from Peter Alice, uh, the, the, the golf commentator. And I was watching, it was the British Open I was watching. I couldn't tell you what year it was. But um, some golfer tried something that was a bit out of the ordinary and it didn't come off. And Peter Alice just said, golf is a simple game made complicated by those that play it. And <laughs> that is like, that's it in a nutshell. It's the same thing with tennis, with soccer, with, with, with basketball, anything. We make these things probably more complicated than they need to be. At the end of the day, it's about hitting the ball. It's about hitting the ball well. And I think all Gilbert's done here with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of fanfare and colorful language is just reminding them to keep things simple. Like you've got the keys to, to be able to do it. The game's complicated enough. There's no need to add layers of complexity to it. Yeah, it, it's, it's a really great kind of section in the book. We, I'm going to jump straight ahead to championship point. He says, half the crowd is yelling my name. The other half is yelling, shh. I hit another sizzling first serve where Medvedev steps to his side and takes a chicken wing swing. I'm the second person to know that I've won the French Open. Brad is the first. Medvedev is the third. The ball lands well beyond the baseline. Watching it fall is one of the great joys of my life. I raise my arms and my racket falls on the clay. I'm sobbing. I'm rubbing my head. I'm terrified how good this feels. Winning isn't supposed to feel this good. Winning is never supposed to matter this much. I even reserve some gratitude for myself for all the good and bad choices that have led here. That's a, it's a great kind of moment. Even in that, even in that moment of celebration, he, he still can't quite give himself the credit that he potentially deserves. I even reserve some gratitude for myself. What a line that is. God, imagine you be kind to yourself or be nice to yourself in these moments. Yeah, and, 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 and that's really what it boils down to. We see this with athletes. They are so willing to own their mistakes. And when things go badly, like it, they, they wear the heart on their sleeves. They're, when they win and do things well, it's re they, they have a really hard time owning that part of things. I think the advice there is to celebrate your wins as much as you as much as you celebrate your losses and to let both of them go, right? I think that's a, a hugely important tool for athletes to be able to develop. But if you're playing to win, there's nothing wrong with feeling good when you do it. Yeah, ab absolutely. I'm going to kind of uh, hurdle through the next few as, as if putting Grand Slam victories. I'm not going to give his Grand Slam <laughs> victories any credit. But he, he goes on, he wins... Uh, the 1999 US Open, he wins a couple of Australian Opens. And during this time, again, I'm not going to get into it too much. It's an important part of this story, but marries Steffi Graf, one of the greatest female tennis players of all time. They subsequently have some children. I know that's glossing over a big part of the story, but you know, we're not, we're not going to dive too deep into the psychology of marriage on this podcast. But obviously, it's a big turning point. He's turned his career around. He's met the love of his life. And we're really coming towards the end of the story. And um, I, th I think this is a, a nice part. It's, it's setting the scene in the 2006 where the book opened. We're back at the US Open and it's before the Marcus Bagdadis match um, where, where the book opened up. And he says, I'm hobbling through the lobby of the Four Seasons the next morning when a man steps out of the shadows. He grabs my arm. Quit, he says. What? It's my father or a ghost of my father. He looks at Sean. He looks as if he hasn't slept in weeks. Pops, what are you talking about? Just quit. Go home. You did it. It's over. He says he prays for me to retire. He says he can't wait for me to be done so that, I, so that he doesn't have to watch me suffer anymore. He won't have to sit through my matches with his heart in his mouth. He won't have to stay up till two in the morning to catch a match from the other side of the world so that he can scout some new wonder boy that I might have to face soon. He's sick of the whole miserable thing. He sounds as if, is it possible? Yes, I see it in his eyes. I know that look. He hates tennis, he says. Don't put yourself through this anymore. After last night, you have nothing left to prove. I can't see you like this. It's too painful. I reach out and touch your shoulder. I'm sorry, Pops. I can't quit. This can't end with me quitting. I, I think this is kind of a nice full circle with, with his dad. That His dad's just begging him to quit. Well, as we saw him as a seven-year-old, that. You know, Andre wanted to quit, and there was no chance that um, 
no chance that his father would let him quit. I don't know if there's anything you want to dig into there. I, I think you're right. Full circle puts it that way. It, it's, it sounds very much like sort of mission accomplished. All of that investment, I think, has, has obviously paid off um, in, terms of, in terms of his tennis. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to close the, close the kind of uh, quotes from the book here. So after he, he, he wins against Baghdadis, he then plays in the third round um, against Benjamin Becker. And this was, this was Andre on court in his post-match interview. And he says, he says to the U.S. crowd, he says, The scoreboard said I lost today. But what the scoreboard doesn't say is what I have found. Over the last 21 years, I have found loyalty. You have pulled from me on court and also in life. I have found inspiration. You have willed me to succeed, sometimes even in my lowest moments. I, and I have found your generosity. You have given me shoulders to stand on, to reach for my dreams, dreams I could never reach for, reached without you. Over the last 21 years, I have found you, and I will take you and my memory with me for the rest of my life. And that's where we'll leave the book. Um, if you want to read the full book, please Click the link below, and uh, you know this is not audible. We we want you. We definitely encourage you to read the book. Has a lot more in it, um, and we're obviously here to dive into the psychology part. So just stay with us for the last couple of minutes. What we're going to do is wrap up what we would say are the the ten big life lessons to take from Andre's story, and then also the lessons that we want to avoid, the things that we want to avoid when it comes to um, Andre's story. So, Greg, you've done a great job throughout this podcast of kind of reflecting on Andre's story, and I'd love to hear from you. Like, what are your key takeaways? What are your key life lessons from Andre's story? I think the first thing is to have and set clear and specific goals. I think once you've got clear and specific goals, what that does is it helps to provide direction and that helps to feed motivation. So, for example, Andre had the, the goal of winning a match in 28 minutes. That's motivated him to focus and perform at his best. And if you want to know more about that match, you can, you can obviously read the book. Um, second thing would be to embrace fear and uncertainty. They're part and parcel and natural parts of the journey that we have towards success. They are going to be there. They are unescapable. It's about how you navigate that. So I guess his experience of feeling scared before one of his major matches shows that actually acknowledging and facing these emotions head on is really, really important for your per personal growth. I mean, number three, to believe in yourself, self-belief and confidence in your abilities, they're absolutely crucial. So Andre's realization that he, he needs to be only better than one person in that moment highlights the power of believing in yourself and your capacity and capabilities to be able to succeed. I would say that four, adaptability is key. Being flexible and agile in the moment is really, really important to navigate different situations and different challenges that you're going to face during your performances, whatever that might look like. I think number five, learning from your losses. I think a lot of people say that I either win or I lose. I don't like that. You either win or you learn, but you can only learn if that is an active process. It's not going to happen just passively. You've got to actively go and figure out, well, what are the things that I need to learn? What did I do well? What can I do better? And then how can I do that better the next time? I think understanding your subconscious, that it exists and it is a process. It's going on in the background and you can't help to make sense of that. So recognizing the influence that your subconscious mind can have can help you better understand and control or manage the actions that you've got. Number seven, face challenges head on. Really try and focus and, and drive head on at them. So life, just like tennis, requires facing challenges directly and really overcoming them. So I guess his comparison of tennis to boxing really emphasize the importance of confronting difficulties rather than avoiding them. Yes, it's great when you don't get punched, but are you able to take the punch and continue moving forward? I think number eight, managing rebellion constructively. So rebellion is usually just a form of self-expression, finding your authentic self, but it's important to make sure that that's channeled and directed constructively. So obviously, Agassi had a rebellious phase, which we talked about, and really that highlights the psychological struggle of asserting individuality while maintaining a positive and productive path towards your goal. I think number nine, embracing responsibility. So taking on new responsibility, this is something that helps to foster your personal growth. So Agassi's transition from being an amateur player to becoming a professional tennis player at such a young age demonstrates the challenges and opportunities that can come and develop when you take on that increased responsibility. And I think finally, harnessing concentration and focus. They're essential for achieving your goals. Agassi struggled with distractions during matches, things that were coming from off the court, under the court, his own uncertainties. This really emphasized the significance of maintaining your concentration and being able to 
not necessarily get rid of distractions, but be able to bring your focus back to what you need to focus on in any moment to perform at your best in order to maximize your performance. Like you said, Greg, you know, success leaves clues. So when you, uh, when you have success, they leave clues, a little breadcrumbs, and those are 10 great tidbits. So Greg, along with those uh, great life lessons of things that to do to succeed, we also hear in Andre's story, things that we can avoid doing. It's not always, you know, um, success is not always about doing more. It's sometimes it's actually about eliminating things. So I'd love to hear some of the things that we can take from Andre's story that we can avoid. Absolutely. I think there was plenty, plenty in here for us to, to be able to populate this list. So I think the first thing is avoiding self-hatred. So self-loathing, obviously very, very detrimental to your mental health. And obviously that has an impact and a kick on effect for your overall performance. So in essence, it's important to maintain a positive self-image, treat yourself with a little bit of grace, a little bit of kindness and a little bit of respect, that gratitude that Agassi mentioned that he managed to save a little bit just for himself. Number two, Avoid breaking rules without a purpose. Navigating boundaries and guardrails, yes, and pushing back on things, that is important to challenge the norms and think outside the box and create new ways of working. But breaking rules without a clear purpose, all that does is leads to unnecessary complications. Number three, avoid underestimating your opponents. So this can lead to just complacency and underperformance. I guess he lays this out in the book, playing down to the, uh, to the other opponents and, and maybe not giving the credit to the other people around him. Always respect your competition, whether that's in life, whether that's in sport, whether that's in business, whatever your performance arena. And the goal is always to strive to perform at your best, regardless of the opponent's perceived skill level on the other side. Remember that you might not even always know the skill level of your opponent. Avoid holding on to losses. Well, it's important that you learn from losses, and that's obviously something that we talked about as being a real positive. Holding on to them and really keeping a tight grasp on them can hinder your ability to move forward and improve and learn from those losses. Learn to accept them in the same way that you accept winning. They're just part of the journey and focus on the lessons that they provide and how they can propel you forward. Avoid losing on purpose. This sounds really, really stupid, but it's, it's, it's easy to fall into this trap. And this behavior can undermine your integrity and prevent you from truly testing and improving your skills. Always strive to win and always strive to face those challenges head on. This is definitely a big one for me. Avoid neglecting your physical conditioning. Neglecting your physical conditioning can lead to poor performance without a shadow of a doubt. Regular physical training is crucial for maintaining and improving performance, not just physical performance. If you're looking to, uh, to, to be on the athletic side, yes, of course, you need your body to be in tip shop, tip top shape to perform at your best. But physical conditioning, we know it's a proven science back tactic to improve mental health as well. So when you're working out, realize that you're not just taking care of your body, but you're also taking care of your mind. Number seven, avoid negative self-talk. Try to maintain a positive mindset and use constructive criticism to improve. Remember, not to, to think negatively. The best way to do that is to think positively. Fill that attentional space with as much good stuff as you possibly can so there isn't the room for negativity to come in there. Uh, <laughs> number eight, avoid avoidance. Face challenges head on. Even if they seem daunting or really difficult that you might not feel like you've got the capabilities to, to deal with them, it's crucial for your personal and professional growth to really, really embrace these challenges. Avoid living through others. Try to live out other people's dream rather than your own it can be hugely psychologically damaging. Pursue your own passions, have a clear understanding of what those, are, what those are, and define success on your own terms. And finally, avoiding isolation. Isolation can lead to stagnation, poor mental health, feelings of loneliness and helplessness. Seek out diverse relationships and continue to nourish the relationship that, relationships that you have, those friendships. Reach out, even if it, you don't have a reason to talk to someone, still reach out and just instigate that conversation as part of your personal growth. So really enjoyed uh, taking you on this journey today. I think a lot of learnings, certainly for me, Duncan, I hope there was a lot of learnings in there for you as well. If you enjoyed this as well and you're interested in, in staying abreast on what we're doing, please uh, click like and subscribe. Keep your eye out for any, uh, uh, any future episodes that we're going to do together. We're really enjoying this process and looking forward to continue developing you and ourselves as performers.